Welcome to worship. My name's Joe Varner, and I get to be the pastor of Thalia United Methodist Church. I'm so glad to have this chance to share in worship with you wherever you may be. If you're in the comfort of your home, if you're out to brunch with friends, hello friends. We're so glad that we have this ability to connect online. We're still wading through the pandemic like everyone else, and we currently do not have a date for our return to in-person worship. But since the love of God cannot be separated by the pandemic or our ability to connect in person, we're going to keep worshiping together virtually. So we want to thank you for being a part of this, a part of our effort to make church a verb, not just a place that we go or who we are, but something that we do. So thank you for doing church with us this week online. I want to set up our message and our theme this week. We're going to talk about liberty. And what a great weekend to do that. We're also going through a book series called Floodgates, and we're in chapter 2. And the theme of chapter 2 is breakthrough prayer. The thing that's going to tie these two things together is actually our scripture reading. Romans chapter 7 actually talks about our being delivered from misery, a movement from misery to delivery. And maybe many of you feel like you've been stuck in a miserable situation. And Paul actually has some words through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to speak to our misery. So right now, we're going to go into our reading from Romans chapter 7. But before we get to our reading... I'm sensing a need to go to God's throne of grace in prayer. So as we get ourselves ready to hear God's word, I want to invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks for your grace that knows no end. We thank you for your love, for the love that nothing can separate us from, no matter if it's death or worry, anxiety, fear, depression, none of this can separate us from your love. And so right now we're asking for fresh inspiration from your Holy Spirit. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We are in Romans chapter 7 this week, and many of you, if you've read through Romans, probably paused when you came to this section in Scripture. The section actually starts around 13, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to begin at verse 15. And you may relate to some of what Paul is lamenting about here in this passage. He's really trying to describe the human predicament. In other words, he's saying that the good that I want to do, I do not do. And the evil that I don't want to do, I end up doing. But let's hear from Paul here in Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 15. I don't know what I'm doing. Are you feeling that way? Do you feel like you're not sure of what's really going on in your life? He says, I don't know what I'm doing because I don't do what I want to do. Instead, I do the thing that I hate. But if I'm doing the thing that I don't want to do, I'm agreeing that the law is right. But now I'm not the one doing it anymore. Instead, it's sin that lives in me. I know that good doesn't live in me, that is, in my body. The desire to do good is inside of me, but I can't do it. I don't do the good that I want to do. But I do the evil that I don't want to do. But if I do the very thing that I don't want to do, then I'm the, not the one doing it anymore. Instead, it is sin that lives in me that is doing it. So I find that as a rule, when I want to do what is good, evil is right there with me. I gladly agree with the law on the inside, but I see a different law at work in my body. It wages a war against the law of my mind and takes me prisoner with the law of sin that is in my body. I'm a miserable human being. Who will deliver me from this dead corpse? 
thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord for the delivery we have from our misery. Many of you may be traveling this weekend as a part of your 4th of July celebration. Maybe you got off on Friday and you've headed out to go do something fun wherever things are that are open this weekend. But as we celebrate life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, we as a church are, are here to remember God's ultimate breakthrough. That breakthrough from slavery to sin. Paul uses language here that's reminiscent of the Hebrew story. When we go back into the Old Testament, when we remember Moses and how God used Moses to lead the Hebrew people, the Israelites, out of slavery in Egypt, through the sea, 40 years of wandering, and finally to the Promised Land. This story is an extremely important story for us as a people of faith. It's a defining moment when God brought His people out of slavery. He delivered them from slavery. He set them free. He liberated them. It was like their own Independence Day, except obviously the characters are very different than our corporate memory of July 4th, 1776. The founders of what we call today the United States of America had a vision of a people governed by themselves. They wanted to be free from tyrannical rule in what we call the United Kingdom today. And so we're celebrating that this weekend. And what a great weekend as we remember the freedom that we have in the United States to remember the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. Now, Paul is naming a predicament here in chapter 7 that's extremely relevant for our own lives today. He's describing what you and I feel on a daily basis is that we want to do good, but when we want to do good, we feel that evil is right there with us, and we end up doing the things that we don't want to do. Have you ever been frustrated by this predicament? And he goes on to cry out. He says, I'm a miserable human being. And maybe Paul is giving voice to your own lament. Maybe you are feeling misery. Maybe you're feeling entrapped by fear, by addiction, by sadness. Maybe you're feeling isolated because of this pandemic that's still dragging on. Paul says, who will set me free? And the answer, thank God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank God. He goes on to pose this question, who's going to set me free from this predicament? And then he answers the question with this thanksgiving. He says, thanks be to God. Because earlier he had already written about the victory that we have through Jesus Christ. God has delivered us from the misery of feeling enslaved by sin. This reminds me of one of our most iconic images as the United States of America. The Statue of Liberty was dedicated in 1886. Roughly 20 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, and the end of slavery in the South, the conclusion of the Civil War. And so uh, a French diplomat actually proposed that his country offer the Statue of Liberty as a sign to the United States of this sort of enlightenment theory of freedom. And so at the base of the Statue of Liberty, I actually learned that this week, at the base of the Statue of Liberty, are these broken shackles and broken chains. You know, I had seen the Statue of Liberty in lots of pictures over time, and for whatever reason, it hadn't struck me that those chains serve to tell a story. They are celebrating the end of slavery in the United States of America. You know, but for some folks, it's kind of an ironic image. 
that while slavery ended, there still weren't fully equal rights for all American citizens after that. So I did a little digging and I found that there are other examples of freedom, of liberty that helped to tell our story as a country. There's a family that donated a, a personal document to one of the Smithsonian Museums in Washington, D.C. And it's this handmade tin case. And it holds what must feel like sacred documents. It's a certificate of freedom for Joseph Trammell. You can look this up and you can see it online for yourself. And for this family, it's a sign of his freedom. See, as an African American, at that time in his life, it wasn't normal for someone like him to be free in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so he had to carry this tent around with this documentation that he, in fact, was free. Can you imagine having to walk around every day carrying around this tin case with the documents to prove that you were a free person. And I'm sure for, for his family that it means a lot that the rest of us to get to go and to see what that must be like. It's a sign of freedom. Well, you know, for us as a people of faith, this sacred text is one of our signs of our freedom. But you know, there are times when we still feel enslaved Many of us might feel enslaved to fear right now. How many of us are afraid of everything that we're seeing on the news, of the turmoil in our country, the racial division, uh, police brutality, of our firefighters getting abused when they respond to calls, when you look at the, the presidential race that's going on, when you look at the discord around the world, of course we've got lots of reasons to fear, not to mention the coronavirus that's still looming over all of our heads. We're uncertain about our future. We're uncertain about how today is going to go. We, we can feel this any time we walk into an establishment and people aren't observing the six feet of social distance and we might feel some of that anxiety creep in. Maybe it's in your place of work. The list of fears can go on and on. And while we want to put all of our trust in God, while we want to feel peace and contentment, we still deep depend on God to break through the chains of fear and remind us of the freedom that we have been given through Jesus Christ. That's why I believe it's so important for us to reflect on this week's chapter in the book Floodgates on breakthrough prayer. In a nutshell, the concept of breakthrough prayer is adding a dimension of prayer to our lives where we are specifically asking God to do what we cannot do. We're asking for God to do what only God can do. We're begging God to do a new thing in a new time in a new place. We're asking for God-sized miracles. So the practice of breakthrough prayer can happen anytime in our lives. As we build the practice of breakthrough prayer, we can do what Sue Nelson Kibbe describes as prevailing prayer. Anytime we come across a circumstance where we're feeling afraid or sad or lonely or confused, is to see every circumstance in our life as an occasion to practice breakthrough prayer. So what does breakthrough prayer look like? It's when we confront this obstacle in our lives. And we know that by our own power, we can't cross this threshold. We can't make a path through the sea. We can't make a way where there is no way. And we need God to do that for us. It's like when the Hebrew people, after they had been released from slavery in Egypt, made it to the shore of the Red Sea. And here comes Pharaoh and his army. And the people begin to panic. They've been set free, and now God has brought them to the edge of the sea to die. And so Moses turns to them and says, You don't need to worry. Just be still, and the Lord will act. And that sounds like a really good place to end the story. 
Except God tells Moses to get moving, to remember what he'd been given, what was in his hand. It was this staff. And God instructs Moses to raise his hands over the water. And then God makes a way for the Hebrew people where there was no way. God carves a path through the Red Sea. God broke through the sea to let God's people pass safely to the other side. Maybe you're facing your own Red Sea moment. Maybe you're confronting the misery of your situation and you, like Paul, are crying out, who will save me from this miserable situation? Thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord because we belong to the God who can make a way where there is no way. We belong to a God who is still with us even if we feel like we're succumbing to the elements around us. It's a practice of breakthrough prayer that empowers us, that encourages us, and unites us to remember the liberty that we've been given through Jesus Christ. You see, Romans chapter 7 makes no sense on its own. If you actually go on to read the end of chapter 7, it closes with these words. So then I'm a slave to God's law in my mind, but I'm a slave to sin's, God, sin's law in my body. That doesn't sound like a good place to leave things. But through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul goes on to write these words in chapter 8. So now, there isn't any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Paul is using the language of liberty, of rescue, of delivery. The same language that we use to tell the story of the Hebrew people going from slavery to freedom through the sea. God has done what was impossible for the law. God has done the impossible. God has already accomplished the impossible. And we get to live into that reality right now. We do not have to wait to go to heaven to practice living like we're already in heaven because of what God has already done in Jesus Christ. It is true that the world is not as it should be Yet, but it is also true that God has already set us free to practice living as if we've already crossed the other side. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What kind of a miserable situation do you need rescue from right now? Are you wallowing in fear or doubt? Take this moment to practice breakthrough prayer, inviting God to do what only God can do. Persevere in your prayer because God does nothing except an answer to prayer. With that being said, Let's go to God's throne of grace in prayer. Now, as we go to God's throne of grace in prayer, I want to talk a little bit about what breakthrough prayer really is all about. Sue Nelson Kibbe describes three ways to approach breakthrough prayer. One is the threshold prayers. The other is archer's prayer. And the other is one I described in the message called prevailing prayer. The first way to practice breakthrough prayer is to simply open up your heart to God by praying that classic prayer from Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. God, your will be done. Basically, in threshold prayers, we're asking God to bring us to the threshold of simply seeing where we need breakthroughs. So if you don't know what to pray for, the idea here is that God will help show you where we need breakthroughs in our lives. Archer's prayer has to do with knowing 
what our target is, meaning we can see an obstacle or we recognize that there is something specifically that we need help with. And so the idea here is that we target our prayers. For example, if you've been wrestling with fear, we commit to praying to God, asking to break through our fears until we get what God wants for us. And that's breaking through fear, feeling peace, feeling joy, feeling love. The other one is prevailing prayer. And that's when we take every moment of our lives as an occasion to ask God to break through the situation. So our church has its own breakthrough prayer. And that's going to be a part of our prayer time here together. We ask God to let God's love break through and flourish in every aspect of our lives. Have you ever seen weeds creeping up between the sidewalk lines? That's what we want from God's love. We want God's love like an unwelcome weed to break through the cracks in our lives and to take over and flourish in every aspect. But we also surrender to God's purpose. Surrender is key to unlocking the floodgate of breakthrough prayer. You see, it's one thing to simply ask God to do something about our situation. We actually have to surrender to what God wants to do in the first place. So that's the second part of our church's breakthrough prayer. We surrender to God's purpose so that God can do far more than we can even begin to imagine. And so with this concept in mind, let's go now to God's throne of grace in prayer. Almighty God, we pray that you would illuminate us to the places in our lives where we are still held captive. As a society, as a church, and as your children, maybe many of us feel crippled by fear or we feel enslaved by debt. We feel overcome by doubt and depression. Whatever it is, we pray that you would first of all open our eyes to the places in our lives where we need your holy power breakthroughs. We know that there are specific acts of injustice. We know that there is a thing called systemic racism. We know that there are principalities and powers at work in our world. And so we ask that you would break through our fear and our doubt. God, we pray that we would take every opportunity to practice prevailing prayer, knowing that whatever circumstances we may come up against this week, we have the power of breakthrough prayer at our disposal. And so we offer to you all of our lives asking that your love would break through and flourish in every aspect of our lives. We surrender to your purpose so you can do far more than we imagine. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. As part of our worship, we take every week to celebrate all that God has given us by offering back a portion of those gifts to God's service. And so we're going to take this time during our offertory to offer ourselves and our gifts to God. Part of our offering this week is going to be a challenge to join us in the practice of breakthrough prayer. So we want to ask you, if you know of a specific area in your life or in our church's life, to offer up that situation to God's throne of grace through the practice of breakthrough prayer. If you're not sure yet what exactly breakthrough prayer is or how to incorporate it in your life, I want to also offer this challenge. Maybe you're willing to go on a prayer walk in your neighborhood or around our church or even from your home if it's hard to get around. But from your home or in your streets to ask God to break through in your neighborhood, in your home, and our church and to do what only God can do. We're praying for God-sized miracles. We're praying for new opportunities to do ministry in a new day. And so we want to invite you to pray with us using this practice of breakthrough prayer as a part of our offering this week. So let's go now to God's throne of grace as we offer ourselves 
and our gifts to God. Knowing now that the law of the Spirit of life has set you free through Jesus Christ, may you go boldly to love and serve the Lord in all that you do. And may the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. <laughs>